Uh, we're doing another one of these live. We're in Matthew chapter 21 today. This is, I guess, Sunday Night Bible Study on Tuesday. Got some uh, exciting potential news. I was talking with uh, Lowell, one of our IT guys, video recording guys. We might be getting a new camera soon, which will make uh, the quality of this even well better than it is right now. So, pretty excited about that. Okay, so, we got to get to work. Behind a couple weeks, we're in Matthew chapter 21. For those of you who followed along in our series of Matthew. So, um, about to get started on that. Before I do, um, don't forget we have a podcast, guys. Um, and we're, we're revamping some things before we start season 5. Bringing in some different guests and doing some different topics. But that's on YouTube, Point Taking Christian Podcast. Go on there and listen every now and then. Like, share, subscribe, comment, do all that kind of stuff, you know? Hey, Janine, how are you? Um, how's work been, Janine? Sometimes I miss working over there. It was fun. Okay. Um, yeah, guys, we're already planning our mission trip for next year. Well, one potential mission trip. There might be an, another one, but one potential one to Puerto Rico where we've been the past couple years. <laughs> and I don't know how many people we're taking yet, but I know we've had 64 people sign up just from our church. 64. And that's still 11 months away. Goodness gracious. Hey, Jennifer. So, that's crazy. I, again, I don't know that we're taking that many, but 64 people have signed up for the mission trip next year. Uh, and I'm really excited that uh, a, a pretty decent size of us, a, a group of us, are going to Israel. Uh, and I guess that's eight months away. Uh, and I am fortunate enough to be able to go to that as well, and I'm really excited. So, that will be fun. And it will be fun because, like, some of the things we're going to read about today, I'm going to get to see, which is incredible. All right, y'all, let's get to work. Matthew chapter 21. All right, this is called the triumphal entry. Remember, I told you last time we did one of these? Everything for the rest of the book of Matthew will... Let me start over. These next few chapters all take place in Jesus' final week of life here on earth before he dies and raises again. So the next several chapters, I guess I guess the next seven chapters, all take place in a final week, in one week. So let's get to work. Uh, verse 1, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, Jesus is coming from the east to the Mount of Olives, He's going to go into the city, and then he'll come back to the Mount of Olives in a couple days. Anyway, Jesus sent two disciples ahead, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you'll say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Now, when you see that phrase in your Bible... This took place to, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. You should know that we're about to have a quote from the Old Testament. There's a lot of indicators like that. As it is written, according to the scripture, um, according to the prophet. Uh, these are indicators that the New Testament writer is quoting from the Old Testament. Verse 5, which is a quote. Say to his daughter Zion, Behold, your king is coming, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. That's from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them on their, uh, put on them their cloaks, and Jesus sat on them. Not the donkey and the colt. He sat on the clothes. Jesus sat on the colt, the young donkey. The, the, the other donkey was just there maybe other stuff was on it but Jesus sat on the colt the young donkey now it's amazing because the Jews who knew their Bible best would have known that Zechariah chapter 9 
was about the Messiah and just just looking over there for a minute. Uh, let's see Habakkuk, Zephaniah, yeah, Zechariah, yeah. Zechariah chapter nine, from the original quote says, "Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey." So, there's Old Testament prophecy here showing that the Messiah, the promised one, would ride into town on a young donkey. So when they see this, they perceive that Jesus really is the Messiah, the king. Only problem is this, they want this king to do something for them. They don't want to serve the king. We'll get to that in just a moment. So they recognize the messianic prophecy and they spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went before him and then followed him are shouting crowds not just a crowd crowds of people in front of him and behind him as he's riding on a donkey into Jerusalem screaming Hosanna to the son of David blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So, think about what just happened. Jesus comes in riding on a donkey, and those who knew their Old Testament best knew this was a messianic prophecy, a prophecy about the Messiah. This is how he was going to come. And they're all excited because they think he's coming to take over and to remove them from under the thumb of the Romans. Now, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, this is a quote from Psalm 118, one of the most cited passages from the Old Testament and New Testament. And I've been over this before. Son of David is a messianic title, meaning um, it was known the Messiah, the promised one, the prophesied one, would come from the line of David. So, uh, with that being said, they knew that Jesus was from the line of David, so he's already a possible candidate. So when you have someone call him the son of David, they're calling him the Messiah. Now, um, the crowd's treating, treating Jesus like a king in appearance. But in fact, they don't want a king over their own lives, only over the Romans, over their oppressors. And I'll read what I wrote here. It's as if they were saying... Jesus, come save us now, be the king of Israel, and rule with authority as you take care of our trials and tribulations. Only don't rule over my life individually. That's not your place. Anyone who watches this, if this is you, I want you to be warned. If you are happy to have Jesus as the sovereign king over the universe or governments or nations, but not over your own life, you need to be warned because you're acting just like these people here. They were happy to have Jesus be the king over the universe, over nations, but not over their lives. Do you believe God has the authority to tell you how to live? And if you say, oh yes, pastor, I do, how well do you obey him now? And if your attitude is, eh, well, you know, everyone sins, or, you know, eh, I do okay, you don't really see him as the authoritative king. You don't. Uh, be warned about that. At any rate, verse 12. Oh, well, also, um, note they're saying Hosanna, which means Lord save us, when they should be saying Hallelujah, praise Yahweh. Over the course of the next week, we'll see a dramatic shift in the crowd's attitude towards Jesus just in the course of the next few days because this crowd this crowd uh, is the same crowd that in what six days is going to be saying crucify him in, in six days this crowd that is screaming in the streets of Jerusalem Hosanna uh, 
in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Lord, save us now. This crowd in six days is going to be screaming, crucify him. So let's look at what happens over the next six days. Alright, so, verse 12, as Jesus entered the temple, he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. If you recall, he's already done this once before. He did this in John chapter 2. Uh, at that time, he made a whip, if you remember, and uh, whipped anyone who wouldn't get out of his way. Remember, Jesus only went to Jerusalem, I can't remember exactly, three or four times his in his uh, earthly ministry. In other words, from the time he was 30 to 33, or 33 to 36, or however, however old he was when he died, he only went to Jerusalem a handful of times. In John chapter 2, he had a short visit there, and he cleared out the temple with the same type thing. Money changers were doing their thing. Uh, well, this is several years later, probably two or three years later, and he is having to clear it out again. Uh, and he clears it out again, and people are... There are money changers there, and they're, and they're selling pigeons. And let me explain to you the idea of the money changing here. What's happening is this. We have Passover where everyone is supposed to bring an animal to sacrifice, supposed to bring a lamb to sacrifice uh, for their sins. This was a one of the seven yearly festivals, and this one's one of the most important ones. Um, it Does anyone remember... By the way, we got a few people watching now. Does anyone remember what the first Passover was? When it was? When was the first Passover celebrated? Because every Passover after that is a memorial, is a remembrance of the first one. Just like it's supposed to be that the 4th of July, Independence Day, is a memory of 1776. And, uh, yes, we have a correct answer here. The first Passover was when the Israelites left Egypt. Um, and it's called Passover because when the angel of death, Jesus himself, when the angel of death went to destroy the firstborn of Egypt, firstborn cattle, firstborn human, firstborn son of everything, when he went to destroy the firstborn male child, the angel that passed over anyone who had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. So literally they killed the lamb. And if you couldn't afford one, you stayed at the neighbor's house. You shared. Anyone who had the blood of the lamb. And they killed it and they um, took some of the blood from the lamb, the carcass, and wiped it over the top of the door. And the angel that would pass over any house who had the blood of the lamb covering it. Now you might ask why. Why did God tell them to sacrifice a lamb and wipe the door on the blood? It's kind of wipe the door on the blood. Wipe the blood on the door. It's kind of an odd request. Remember, there are some crimes, some sins, right, that are deserving of capital punishment, of the death penalty. Remember when God lays out his um, law in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, there were 16 sins that got the death penalty. Well, in the Garden of Eden, remember that Adam and Eve's sins, sin was a capital crime. It deserved the death penalty because they betrayed the sovereign of the universe. That's treason. And treason gets the death penalty. Instead... God killed animals and made skins for them and covered them. Something had to die. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God is a, God is a just God, and sin must be paid for. Sin that deserves the death penalty must be paid for. Or God is not just. So, something had to die. Those lambs died, and... The angel of death passed over anyone who had the blood of the lamb 
on their doorpost, which symbolically would represent Jesus Christ. You know, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, what? Behold the Lamb of God, who doesn't just pass over, but the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. So, this is his second time clearing out the temple. And he says in verse 13, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it into a den of robber, uh, robbers. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Verse 15, When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. I love this part. So the kids recognized he was the Messiah. The kids recognized that he was the son of David. Verse 16, And they said to him, Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise. And leaving them, he went to the city of Bethany and lodged there. So this is his mic drop moment where he leaves and calls it a day after he says this. So some kids are calling him the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament, the son of David. And the chief priests and the elders, the, the head religious leaders who are against Jesus, are like, hey man, do you not hear they're calling you the Messiah? And Jesus said, yep. The Bible says, out of the mouths of babes and infants you have prepared praise. In other words, yep, and they're right. And the Bible says that sometimes kids will get it right. I love Jesus' answer. He said, yeah, have you never read the Bible? Uh, I want to go to what they're quoting, which is Psalm 8. And I want you to see who Psalm 8 is originally about. Because Jesus just made Psalm 8 about himself. Does anyone see that? The kids are calling him the Messiah. And he and the Pharisees, the, the chief priests and the elders say, Do you don't, don't you hear what they're saying? And then Jesus quotes Psalm 8 and says, yeah. Psalm 8 says, Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you've prepared praise. So, let's look at Psalm 8. I want you to see who it's originally about. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. First off, notice God has put man in charge of all creation, just like he did in the beginning of the garden. All creation is for him and answers to him. He is the supreme of God's creation. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, but more than that, notice this verse is about God, about Yahweh. O Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. See, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, uh, the enemy and the avenger. The quote in Psalm 8 is about God, Yahweh. And Jesus quotes Psalm 8 in Matthew 21 and says, Yes, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you've prepared praise. Makes it about him. Jesus identifies himself as Yahweh, as God, so many times. But I think the clearest way he does it is by quoting Old Testament passages about Yahweh and applying them to himself. Verse 18, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And said to it, May fruit never come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And the disciples saw it, and they marveled, and said, See how the fig tree withered at once? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and don't doubt, not only will you not do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say the mountains be taken up and thrown in the sea, it will happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. The This parable about the fig tree. Um, it's an analogy. It's a metaphor Jesus is using here. 
He goes by the fig tree, and there's leaves on it, but no figs. Meaning it's not dead. It looks like it should be bearing fruit, but it's not bearing any fruit. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote here. Jesus uses the fig tree as an object lesson for unbelieving and unfruitful Israel. Perhaps specifically the religious leaders. The tree was not dead when Jesus found it as it was producing leaves but no fruit. Thus the implication is that the tree looked like it should be producing fruit but it wasn't. The religious leaders and Israel as a whole looked like they should be producing fruit, spiritual growth, and holy living but they weren't. What's more is the leaders are teaching people to do the opposite. Remember, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, Romans 3.2. Every Old Testament writer and prophet was a Jew. God chose this small, weak, insignificant ethnicity as his people, and then entrusted them with his word in the beginnings of his message to the world. He carried them through rebellion, flood, blessings, curses, drought, murder, disease, punishment, judges, desire to self-rule, Selfish kings, idolatry, betrayal, treason, unfaithfulness, covenant breaking, and whoring themselves out to every thought and new thing except God. So when Jesus now looks at how far these people whom he set apart have fallen, it makes him not only sad but angry. For this reason a partial hardening has come upon the people of Israel for now. Romans 11 says that won't be forever. Now in this next section, Jesus' authority is challenged, and I like how he answers it. Verse 23, And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered, I'll ask you one question, and if you answer me, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Now Jesus has already answered this, by what authority he does these things. He said he came to do the will of his Father in heaven. But at any rate, verse 25, The baptism of John, from where did it come, from heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he'll say, then why do you not believe them? If we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus knows that if he, identif if he um, identifies himself as Yahweh, the Son of God, the Messiah, etc., one more time, he'll be brought for the Romans. And he has a set day he wants this to happen a few days from now. So he doesn't answer that. He challenges them in front of the crowd. And he uses the crowd to his advantage. They rejected John the Baptist's ministry. Um, and this is a brilliant move by Jesus. The crowd loved John the Baptist. So here's the problem. John the Baptist in John chapter 1 told his followers to start following Jesus. So the Pharisees can't say, the chief priests and the elders, that John the Baptist was telling the truth. Otherwise, they would have to start following Jesus because John told them to start following Jesus. You understand? But they also can't say that John was wrong because the crowds loved John the Baptist. So the Jewish leaders are in the pickle. If they say, yes, John's ministry is from God, then Jesus will ask, why do you not believe him? But if they say... But if they say, no, John's ministry was simply of a man, the crowds in front of them will lose respect for them and be mad. Sorry, I had a typo. Because they all revered John the Baptist as a prophet. So they chose not to answer. Now, Jesus is about to use two parables, which are pretty awesome. Uh, the parable of two sons and the parables of the tenants. And I think... I am going to save these. No, let's go ahead and finish this chapter. All right. Parable of the two sons. What do you think? Verse 28. A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. So the son said, I'm not going. But then afterward he changed his mind and went. And the other son, he said the same, and he said, I will go, sir, but didn't. And Jesus' question is this, which of them did the will of the Father? So the first son said, Dad, I'm not going to work, and then changed my mind and went and worked. The second one said, I'll go and work, and then didn't go. Which one did the will of the Father? And they answered the first one. Even though they, dis they disobeyed at first, they eventually obeyed. The second one said he would obey and never did. So while they both disobeyed, one eventually did the will of the Father, the other didn't. 
And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes will go to the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. In other words, originally, the Jewish leaders claim, Yes, I believe God, I'll obey him. And then they don't. The Gentiles originally said, I will not obey him, but then many of them have. Well, they will enter the kingdom of heaven because they did the will of the Father in the end. All right, now this next one is one of my favorites. This is verse 33 through 46. It is one of the most amazing, mic-dropping, direct and authoritative things Jesus ever said. It's called the parable of the tenants, or the parable of the landowner, or the parable of the wicked vine and growers. There's a lot of um, names for this parable. All right, let me tell you a little bit of the characters, and then let's get after it. The master of the house is God. The tenants of the vineyard was leased to are the Jewish leaders. The master's servants are the prophets. The master's son is Jesus. Now, here we go. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a master of the house, that's God, who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit, to collect what's his. These are the prophets of the Old Testament. They're going to see how God's people are obeying and collect the fruit they should have been getting this whole time. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another, just like they did with the prophets. Verse 36, he sent other servants, more than the first, and then did the same to them. Finally, he sent his own son to them, saying, They will respect my son. So this is Jesus. But when the ten saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? Now, here's what's amazing. He, Jesus is speaking in the past tense because he already knows he's going to die. He's already predicted it. So he's telling this story in front of the people that are going to put him to death. And he's saying, yeah, this master sent his own son, and they had him killed. What should the master do with those people that had him killed, those servants? And they answer condemnation on themselves. They don't even recognize verse 41. They said, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit of their seasons. Jesus answered them, Have you never read the scriptures? In other words, I'm speaking about you. Notice Jesus is speaking in the past tense in verse 37 through 39. Thus giving credence to the certainty of his own prediction of his death, burial, and resurrection. At first, the Jewish leaders don't recognize he's talking about them. They will in a minute. Jesus said, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Can you be described to that as a person producing the fruits of the kingdom of God? And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus will either be the cornerstone that a foundation is built on or a rock of stumbling or a rock that crushes people. There is no in-between with Jesus. He's either the Savior and Lord or he's a rock that will crush you under the weight of who he really is. Verse 45, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard that he's parables, they perceived he was speaking about them, and although they were seeking to arrest him, just like the parable said they would, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Um, again, the quote there was from Psalm 118. Uh, an often quoted passage from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Pretty amazing. So, Jesus literally... It's almost like what was it Nathan the prophet did to David. He tells a parable about them. And they don't recognize it's about them. And they say, yeah, whoever did that should die. And Jesus reveals to them it's them. Instead of repenting, their attitude is, yeah, let's kill him. Just like the parable said we would. That's Matthew 21. Right at 30 minutes. Pretty good. Pretty good for a chapter. All right, we'll do Matthew 22 next time.
pretty uh, pretty awesome chapter there as well. And I can't wait to get to chapter 23. Probably Jesus' harshest words. Alright guys. Thanks for listening. I will see you all next time. Uh, God bless. Keep reading and obeying his word. See you later.